One of the first financial institutions to really embrace generative AI has been Morgan Stanley. Uh, they actually, for the last year and a half, even before ChatGPT was launched, they were working with OpenAI, the, the creators uh, of ChatGPT. What they were trying to figure out was, how do we really get a better grip of what the concept of scale means in an AI-powered world? So they took about 300 of their financial advisors. They took the technology from OpenAI. They didn't sort of just train it on public data. They took all of their internal documents, their investment information. They put guardrails on this thing uh, so that it wouldn't hallucinate and create false data. They made it very simple for the advisors to then ask questions relevant to their work that would allow them to be more productive and get solve problems more quickly for their clients. And then every time the system gave an answer, it would then source, reference the source of it and the document where it got it from. So you could validate whether that was actually correct advice or not. Uh, but so far, the experiment's been running for a few months for about 300 advisors. It's been really interesting because it starts to change really what the definition of work is for an, for an advisor. Uh, rather than sort of doing a lot of laborious tasks and document collection and creation, they can now really get to the heart of where you're delivering value. And the plan is, of course, is to then scale that up to 16,000 of their, their advisors. What we're starting to see is this question of what is valuable work? Um, how do you really take the intellectual property inside your organization, whether it's hidden in documents or PowerPoints or emails or even in people's minds? And how do you then productize that at scale so that you can be more effective? How impactful are your people? How do you make sure that you're getting maximum leverage of the insights and talent that you bring together? And, and one of the most dangerous questions I think we're going to have to ask ourselves in the next few years is, you know, how many people do we really need inside our organizations? How do we make sure we really have talent density? I mean, consider these companies. Try and guess how many people work there. I mean, Twitter's an interesting one because it's falling by the day, right? Um, Elon Musk has done this experiment. It's like he's, you know, playing that childhood game of Jenga, you know, trying to pull out the blocks uh, and see, like, which is the block he pulls out where the whole thing falls down. But they've got about uh, 1,300 staff now, you know, which is about a third of what they had previously. Uh, OpenAI, you know, the company which has kind of sent shockwaves to the AI industry, technology industry, is 375. WhatsApp, when it sold for about $20 billion, they, they managed to create a global telecommunications platform only had 55 people. Moderna, when they created the vaccine, you know, before they had to scale up for distribution, they only had 830 employees. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Now, just in case you think that this is really a function of being a technology company or not, and tech companies somehow are going to be immune from this, I mean, consider this example, which I think is really interesting. Adobe has almost 44,000 employees worldwide making their software. Midjourney, which is a generative AI, let's say, disruptor to the traditional way of creating edit editing photos, has 11 staff. And I don't want to do this to terrify you and to make you think that AI is going to destroy jobs or that we're not going to need advisors in the future, all that standard narrative. But what this does put a very sharp spotlight on is what is the valuable work that your people do? And how can you now start leveraging technologies and platforms and tools to make sure that they're doing more of that as much as possible? Um, and I don't know if you, you remember that movie, Her, yeah, you know, with Scarlett Johansson. There was sort of that really poignant moment at the end where he realized that this person who he had such a, who was an AI, of course, who had such a personal relationship with, who knew everything about him. It was so deep and intimate that he, literally he fell in love with her. He wasn't the only one to have that relationship. She'd been maintaining thousands, maybe millions of these highly personalized interactions with, powered by technology. And when I kind of think of the, you know, the AI-powered advisor of the future, it's kind of like Scarlett Johansson. I realize this is rose-tinted glasses. But it's that ability to, how do you have a very personalized, very specific relationship with many clients at once at scale, where they feel like it's individualized, but you're still getting incredible productivity and leverage.